basis for accounting fraud as well. She actually says, I'm thinking of adopting this regulation. The Clinton administration goes berserk, and in particular, Larry Summers, uh, but also Rubin. Now behind Larry Summers, there's another layer. Bob Rubin of Goldman Sachs, the Clinton administration, and Citibank. And he also thought that derivatives were a wonderful thing for the U.S. economy, and he made sure that they were never regulated. Also, we can't forget Alan Greenspan over at the Federal Reserve. Now, you look at Summers, he is sitting in the White House today making policy for Obama. Summers tells Obama what to do. Summers tells Geithner what to do. He's also got some of his hatchet people in the administration. Mary Shapiro runs the Securities and Exchange Commission. She refuses to ban uh, naked short selling and other market manipulations. You've also got another guy called Gensler over at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission today. He is an acolyte and a supporter of the derivatives bubble. We made the new CFTC chair a guy who had helped to kill Brooksley Bourne's reform initiatives. And, and we just did this under the Obama administration. This was a pre-registered, pre-organized, predetermined event. Anybody who knows that if you allow the banks to become unregulated financial institutes with tsunami-like weapons of mass destruction-like financial instruments like derivatives to allow that to run up to levels that are 50, 100, 200 times the gross domestic product with no value. They know that they are taking the profits on going up, but they also know that the end result is the destruction and gutting of this economy. The scam is simple. The insiders buy hard assets and political influence as the fiat bubbles expand. And then, at a time of their choosing, they purposefully implode the bubble. You've got a very small group of people and the Federal Reserve and the global central banking system and the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland who are purposefully managing the boom and bust, credit supply, credit contraction, money supply growth, money supply contraction to create artificial roller coasters and artificial volatility that they can trade around without taking any risk. It doesn't cost them any money. And if they do make a mistake because they're, as George Bush said, oh, the bankers on Wall Street are drunk. It is uncertain. There's no question about it. Wall Street got drunk. One reason they should turn off the TV cameras. <laughs> Wall Street got drunk. Let's say they walk in one day, they push the wrong button, and they lose the bank a billion or five billion or a hundred billion, they can appeal to the government to bail them out. It's a totally asymmetric relationship between bankers and the rest of the economy. If they make a mistake, they get bailed out. If everyone else makes a mistake, they get put in jail, call the terrorists, and we never hear from them again. But it's a more sophisticated form of slavery, and we're going through it today. We see the taxation is going up all the time with the, with the supposed crash of the banks that was not uh, a happening out of the blue. It was set up for this time. They could have kept it going for another few years if it suited them, and then crashed all the bubbles. But now is the time. As they say in their own writings, now is the time. One of the great benefits of an economic model from an economist standpoint is you can basically get whatever results you want. Uh, you can manipulate the inputs to make that happen. And that makes it a, a very easy tool to use to hoodwink other people. These manufactured, these engineered financial catastrophes are the result of a central banking system that has the ability to add and subtract credit, add and, sub add and subtract dollars and money at will to create this roller coaster effect. Because unlike most people, the, the banks are able to make profits as easily on the way down as they can on the way up in any given situation. Volatility is great for banks and professionals. Volatility is not great for the, uh, the most, uh, most average people. Their operatives in government and media then hold the economy hostage by issuing the ultimatum. Give us unlimited bailout money or the economy dies. What's being used is what I call, to try to get the money, is what I call the suicide uh, threat, uh, where, you know, if you, anybody has ever seen the movie Blazing Saddle, the sheriff is surrounded by hostile town folks. He takes out his gun, points it at his head and says, you know, don't move or I'll shoot. Well, that's what the big banks are saying. You know, give us unlimited cash or we'll 
die. And if we die, you'll die because we're too big to fail. It is a false flag attack because Hank Paulson will get up in front of Congress and say, we need $700 billion because that thing, that existential threat, the market is attacking us and we need this handout to fight Mr. Market. Mr. Market is out there. We need to fight Mr. Market. It's an existential threat. Meanwhile, he's the one, he is Mr. Market. He's the one causing the problem. We had Paulson, a representative of Goldman Sachs, who happened to be running the U.S. Treasury, came forward with a hysterical briefing for the Congress, saying we, the Wall Street bankers, demand $700 billion in bailouts. So they say, yes, we'll give you all the money you need. Well, why don't, you know, th these are arsonists. Paulson, uh, Tim, Tim Geithner, Bernanke, they're arsonists. They're asking for more matches. And the Congress is saying, who do we make the check out to? Who do we send these matches to? Who do, who, do, who do we send the matches to? Is a ton of matches enough? Can we send you some gasoline to go with those matches? They're like, yes, please. Don't change our management. Don't pay us what assets are worth. Pay us way more than what our assets are really worth. Don't make us use honest accounting. Allow us to lie. We've just, under congressional pressure, change the accounting rules for the express purpose of making sure that the big banks don't have to report honest losses. The only way they can pass this bill is by creating and sustaining a panic atmosphere. That atmosphere is not justified. Many of us were told in private conversations that if we voted against this bill on Monday that the sky would fall the market would drop two or three thousand points the first day, another couple thousand the second day, and a few members were even told that there would be martial law in America if we voted no. That's what I call fear-mongering. We have, uh, you know, people in the government threatening martial law or things to, to get their way in the executive branch uh, against Congress. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, if you put all these signs together, it doesn't look good at all. That, um, to the extent we are a democracy, we're sort of a hairbreadth away from a police state. Congress aided the bankers in carrying out the biggest heist in history with the so-called banker bailout of 2008. The bailout money, the 13 trillion or so dollars that have been given to the banks, is sitting on the balance sheet of the banks, and that is incurring interest costs and that's going to precipitate the need to flush the system with more cash. And at some point, the dam will break and you're gonna have high, very high inflation, some predict hyperinflation. You cannot print phantom money out of thin air, backed by nothing, and producing practically nothing without destroying the world economy. So unless we cut out the toxic funds the toxic elements of this economy, every time we put in money on this bailout, it's just feeding the fire. It's not making things better. What should have happened is that those banks and investment banks should have been seized. They should have been seized by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Those are zombie banks. The uh, Chase Manhattan, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citibank, Wells Fargo, Wachovia, so on down the line, to AIG in the insurance realm. These are zombie institutions, insolvent, bankrupt. The only thing to do with them is to seize them, put them through Chapter 11 bankruptcy. That'll probably turn into Chapter 7 bankruptcy, liquidation. And above all, triage the derivatives on their books. There's no way to bail out a $1.5 quadrillion black hole of derivatives, but nevertheless, they tried. They will, of course, try to regain some of this money back, but their debts, unlike any other period in history, are now a quantum size bigger than the entire global GDP by a factor of 50 to 100. It's, it's almost infinite amount of debt. If you really look at the numbers because of the massive, massive debt, and right now, total debt in this country is about 375% of the gross domestic product. And that's not including derivatives. If you put the derivatives in, it's probably 20 to 30 times gross domestic product. It's beyond what anybody has ever even considered. While they were looting North America into the ground, the International Banking Syndicate was simultaneously executing the same scam in over 100 other nations. So who got the money? 
to financial institutions in, in Europe and other countries? Which ones? I don't know. Half a trillion dollars and you don't know who got the money? Well, Obama's got uh, one difficulty with this Congress. It's the number of freshman Democrats that got elected. Uh, many of these people know that they <laughs> got their seats from, and, and many of which uh, uh, got seats in, in uh, the Senate and Congress from uh, long-held Republican seats.